thank you. Thank you very much for this. I was saying when I walked in that this is actually the first time in at least six months that I've actually presented to a live audience. So I'm really excited about it. I'm, it's been a lot of Zooming and a lot of black boxes sitting in front of me when I've been doing presentations. So it's actually great to be back. Now, I'm actually someone who moves around a bit, but I, I will be trying to stay constrained to this sort of area here. Um, so this is me. My name's Maria, and I've been at the University of Sunshine Coast for about 20 years now, no, long time. Um, formerly from central Queensland and, and made my way back down here. Um, what I want to share with you tonight is a presentation on human-centred service design in VUCA times. So what I want to focus in on is three main topics and actually start to bring them together so that as business professionals you're able to look at your service and design your service in a way that meets the needs of the flawed human. So that's why it's got human-centred in the top. Because one, sometimes we create services and systems that don't take into the account that, as people, we're emotionally driven, that as people, we're irrational sometimes and that we make mistakes. So when we start to look at service design, we create services for the human. And what we start to look at is this idea of how do people use our service? How do they move through our service? What's their journey? And how is it different for different sort of personas or main groups that we've got? I'm then going to link it together with this idea of risk. Now, particularly at the moment, we know it's unprecedented times, we're experiencing a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of volatility. That's actually impacting how consumers are engaging with us, how our clients are feeling. Because of this uncertainty, it's increasing their perception, <laughs> stay this way, their perception of risk. So I'm going to talk through a couple of different types of risks that are out there for services, and then also ways that you can mitigate that risk. I do talk with my hands, so you will see a lot of this stuff happening, particularly now that I have to stay still. So first of all, I wanted to kick off with the nature of services. So even though we're all service providers and services are a big part of the Australian economy, you know, they're over three quarters of our GDP. Everyone in this room has a service. Most people that we know work in services or have worked in services too, and most new jobs created will be in the service industry. But a lot of people think, well, OK, it's services, but haven't really unpacked it. So, you know, what is a service and how is it different from a good? What characteristics does it have that makes it more risky to purchase than when we're buying a good? So when we buy a good, a good has a physical form, like your sunglasses, your clothes, your shoes, your phone. You can touch it, hold it, smell it, see it. You can taste it. And because it has a physical form, as a human being, we see safety in that. So we, we feel safer when we buy a car because we know what the decision is. We can sit in the car, we can trial it, we can test drive it. But when we buy a service, a service has no physical form. It's intangible, it's impalpable. It's an act, it's a deed, it's a performance. It's something we do to or with others or something that's done to or with something we own. We get our car serviced, so someone does something to something we own. Even childcare is a service where somebody looks after our child, our responsibility. So with your service, it's really important to understand that not having that physical form to that core business that you're selling means that customers perceive there's risk and what happens is if the decision process is slower and they hesitate at certain points. And so your job is obviously to help move them through that decision process to help to get them to a sale or, or to make that close. So one of the things about services is not only is it intangible and impalpable, but as I mentioned, it's an act, a deed or a performance. That's what a service is. And so when we look at a or think of services as a performance, there's this really cool metaphor that's used a lot. And the metaphor is service as theatre. So even tonight, this is a service. There's an audience, that's usually your customers or your clients. There's an actor, that's your staff members, that's me. There's a theatre, so here we literally have a theatre that we're sitting in, but that theatre might be your online, your website or your portal, or it may be a physical store that you've got. The front of the theatre is what the customer can see, but the back of the theatre, the back of house, they can't see. So when we design a service, we often think, where does the actor stand? Where, where are our customers, oh sorry, where are our business uh, employees and what are they saying? What's their script? So when we think of service as theatre, when we start to design it, we start to design it by what's front stage? What can the audience and our customers see? What's backstage? What can't they see? What's all the work that happens behind the scenes to make an event like this happen? Because this event, in effect, is theatre. So there's all these different roles that we consider, the audience, the actor, 
the script? You know, what is your sales pitch? How do you how do you move people and meet and greet them and move them through your service, for example? What are the turns of phrase that you use? For me tonight, my script is the slides, for example. So when we design, we think about these elements, and if we think of service as theatre, it actually helps to move us in the right direction to design services. Now, the best way to design a service, I'm trying to stay still, it's hard. The best way to design a service is actually graphically, is with pictures. So you can do this with sticky notes as a really easy way to start. There's also templates online and things like that. But a really simple way is just using sticky notes. The reason that we represent it graphically is it's just far easier to communicate. Because of the intangible nature of services, because of the complexity, you know, if you tried to write out what your service is and how it's designed, it actually becomes too complicated. It's just too hard to understand. So a picture is the best way forward. So with service design, it usually starts really simple and then we get more complex. So I'm going to walk you through what those steps are. Usually the first step is a really simple flow chart like this. It identifies the key steps that the customer goes through. So we've got here someone staying at a motel. They park their car, they check in, they spend the night, breakfast and check out. So the boxes at the top that don't have a line around them, that's what the customer does. That's their journey, their key steps in a really simple form. The bits underneath in the dotted lines represent what the business does back of, behind the backstage that the customer can't see. So what you start to do here is identify what the customer can see and what they're doing and what they can't see. It's what we call the line of visibility. Now, in most of your services, you will have a back house elements or the, like sometimes called the technical core that people don't see, and then there's the theatre of your, of your business. So a really simple flowchart with sticky notes is a great way to start that. What you then do is start to flesh it out. And when we start to flesh it out, what we start to do is add in these things, the actor, the audience, the script, and this theatre, the front of house, the front stage, and the backstage. So you can see um, right in the middle, I think I have a... Yep, here we have this line of visibility, that line. Now that line is basically our curtain on our stage. What we just delineate what the customer can see and what they can't. We put that line of visibility in there to help us to then figure out what functions are seen and what aren't. Now up the top you'll see the line of interaction. So it's just adding in this very simple line. But what it shows us is that these are the main touch points. This is when the customer interacts with your employee. That's those touch points, or sometimes they're called moments of truth. Okay? That's when the service becomes real. That's when the promise you've made to the market manifests. So that line of interaction is key because you have to know at which touch points the customer actually interacts with you um, and how. So that touch point may be uh, you know, online and others may be face to face depending on the, the nature of your service. And, and you'll see underneath in the green boxes under the, the line of visibility, these are the actions that the business does back of house to prepare. These are things that aren't seen, but that are a key part of it. But the boxes are really simple. This is, this is the way that we start the journey out there. What we start to see too, when we think of services theatre, most theatre has multiple acts. So sometimes we might look at the first act when the customer first comes to the motel, parks their car, comes and checks in. We might say that's act one. And then we look at the second act, what happens with the night's day, and then the third act, when they depart. So by breaking it up into these acts, it actually becomes doable, because sometimes it can be overwhelming. So a part of this process is just thinking through very simply what are the main steps that happen. So you can see, whoop, by presenting it visibly, it makes a difference. Now I just wanted to show you, look, this is some ways that blueprints are presented. Some people have really ones like this where they've got images at the top. You can see in the middle the line of visibility, which distinguishes the backstage activities from the front stage activities. And this is just one way of putting it together. There's not a lot of words in there, but there's enough to prompt you to say, okay, this is what they're doing at each step. You'll notice there's an F up there in the corner, up here. So that's what's called a fail point. So when you start to get to this stage and you start to sort of build your story, for your, you know, your script for your theatre, you indicate fail points. This is where things go wrong, regularly. <laughs> so this is a fail point where you know it's the weak spot. It's sometimes called the critical incident spot. This is the bit that can turn satisfaction into dissatisfaction. So you highlight where these spots are. Why? So that you know to fix them, so that you can mitigate the risk 
or so that you've got a backup plan and you know what to do when things go wrong. So that's one way that a blueprint can look, and they can look lots of different, in lots of different ways. This is another way that some, uh, another organisation has put it together. You can see they've used storm clouds there in red to represent where things go wrong, their fail points. And they can also represent areas such as um, the hearts and whatnot, where that's a point for a passion point, perhaps, or where things can be turned around. You can see the line of visibility. You can see things at a front stage and backstage. Now, this one's a little bit more complex, and they've put it all together. But like I said, you can break it down into small acts, the first act, the second act, the third act. But by doing it this way, it just literally gives you your service on a page. What are the main steps that they do? How do we respond and at what point? Where our key touch points are and where are the points where things go wrong that we can mitigate risk around or that we know um, that exists there? So um, this is another example. You can see with this one just a few words in each of the boxes, different colours. I just want to show you different options so that you can see that it can be as complicated as you want it to be, it can be as simple. I, I suggest you go simple, you know, succinctness and brevity, um, you know, there's a lot of value in that. Because at the end of the day, it's about you mapping out how the customer moves through your service. They move through your theatre production, the act, the deed, the performance that the service is. So with blueprints, you can actually expand them to include the customer journey map. So you'll see here at the bottom, this is actually the blueprint of the business, and at the top you can expand it out to have the customer journey map there. You'll notice that it's got a wiggly line through the middle and it's got little speech bubbles up there, so we'll talk a little bit about how you come up with the journey map. So remember at the beginning I said this is about human-centred design. As humans we're emotional, we're driven by our emotions, we're, our emotions go up and down and move throughout a process. Just think of the last time you used a service. You may not be, have been elated all the way through it and you may have had different emotions and different thoughts at different points. So what we start to do here is map out not only the steps that the customer takes, but also how they feel and what they're thinking, what that inner dialogue is as they're moving through your service. So how do we get to that point? It's based on this notion of personas. Now, Customer journeys, if you tried to map that for every single customer, you wouldn't, <laughs> don't, <laughs> that's probably the simple answer, it's impossible to do. So what we do is we map it for key personas. So what a persona is, is it's a fictional representation of your main types of buyer, your main target market. Most services have more than one target audience that they deal with. So what you can do, so Spotify did a heap of these. Spotify ended up coming up with only five personas. For the millions of people that stream, they identified five characters, if you like. So these are your audience, these are your character audiences. That sort of summed up the main people that bought from them. And when you have this persona in mind, you can then map how they move through your service. It's just much more doable. It actually gets you to where you want, which is a map that shows not only what you do and the steps for the customer journey, but these emotional journeys too. So what it is, is it's a representation of your main target audience types. But what you do is you sort of bring them to life. You give them a name. A lot of the times they give them photos and images. And this is an example of one that Spotify used. So what you can see here is it's actually got a bio. It tells you a little bit about the person. Summer loves to listen to music wherever, whenever possible. It tells you her goals, needs, frustrations and behaviours specifically associated with music, with the industry, the service industry that they're talking about. Probably the biggest part, the takeaway, is like I know that looks comprehensive, is if you write a bio and then identify what they call the pain points or the frustrations, that is probably the key parts out of it that will get you to where you need to know. So this is about that empathy. What are their pain points or frustrations? Because that's where you know you can deliver more value. That's the points where you know you can grow your business. That's the points when you can garner that sort of uh, additional loyalty from your customers. But I just wanted to show you these. And if you actually Google personas, you'll see lots of examples of them come up. This is a sophisticated one, because obviously Spotify is a big company. But when you go online, you might see rather simple, smaller versions of them. I'd say if you come up with personas, maybe three or four is max as, as the most. I, I wouldn't be going any more than that. So you want to look at those main people that you're selling to. And even if you have one or two of them in mind as you start to put it together, to describe their outlook on life and what their frustrations are. 
so that you can design your service in a way that meets or overcomes uh, what their needs are. This is just another one that they had by Spotify. It pretty much has the same information, just presented slightly differently. This one identifies personality attributes as well. What I wanted to point out with this one uh, was the bit down the bottom where it's got music um, is a social experience. What they've actually written is the motto that that person lives by in terms of using that service. And that's probably the other key element I'd have. A bio, their motto, and their, their pain points, their frustrations. That's really all you really need to know about it. Once you have these in mind for these two or three personas, you can start to map their journey. Each of those steps that they take with your business, from parking the car, I can't get a park, the, car, the little bubbles, I can't get a park, the car park's too small, do I have to pay for parking, like where do I pay for that? That minds sort of talk, that chatter, that's what you're putting in there because that's where you're knowing, okay, well what can I improve in the car park or how can I make this more accessible for them? And then as they move in, when they walk, say if it's a motel situation, where do I, you know, the questions they might be asking, where do I stand, it's not clear who I talk to, or do I just walk up to the counter? Those are the sorts of questions you put in, because you, you're basically walking through your service in their shoes and in their mind, so to come up with it. The wiggly line up and down just really shows that emotional ups and downs that people experience when using different services. So they may be quite anxious when they first walk into a service environment that they've never used before. I don't know who to talk to, I don't know what to say, how do I introduce myself? All of those questions, that's what we call script questions, is because the script, they're new to the scripts, they've not used your service before. So you might have a peak in terms of anxiety or worry, and then once they hopefully talk to your employees, it, it recedes away. But that's what the bubbles are in there. That's those main questions that people are asking or thinking of themselves as they use your service alone. And this is where the human-centred bit comes in, because sometimes they're confident and sometimes they doubt themselves. Sometimes they're you know, anxious and sometimes they're not. So these little simple mapping will help you to understand this emotional drive that's pushing people through your services and what they're going through. It also will help you to identify ways to think, okay, so most people walking through the front door might be a bit anxious, so what we'll do is we'll you know, make sure that they meet and greet within two minutes, that we've got a script for that person to say as they walk in the door, that we offer them a, a glass of water or that we've got a welcoming lobby or chair for them to sit in. So you just start to think through how to remedy that situation. There's lots of these types of canvases online that you can get, um, and they're really there to help. So you saw the one there with the experience map on the bottom with the line of emotion up and down with a couple of phases or acts that they go through. There's also the one at the top, which is an empathy map, where you start to look at that persona, that main customer that you sell to and say, you know, what, do, what do they say to themselves when they use our service at the beginning and when they leave? What do they think about our service? when they come in and when they go. What do they do and what do they feel? All of those things matter because often in service environments, people are motivated by emotions first and then the cognition hits it, the, the thinking hits in. Um, we often tend to think it's the other way around where people walk in thinking and then the emotions come in. It's actually the opposite. So in service environments, like this one, the layout, the chairs, the carpeting, the all of those sorts of things play an important role in setting mood and how people feel, how you approach them and your, you know, um, your ability to build rapport quickly are also key parts of it. But look, they're freely available online and often it's just under service design or UX. You will find, um, if you sort of Google those things, that it will become available. Now, one of the things with service design and journey mapping is that we have to consider risk and how people perceive risk. So we're all different. Some of us are risk lovers or risk seekers. Some of us are conservative and we don't want to take risks. And some of us are risk neutral. So when you're thinking of that persona, think about their tolerance for risk, okay? And then think about perhaps how COVID and volatility and uncertainty may elevate their risk or, re or min well, unlikely to minimise it, but elevate their risk. So risk is something that, and our risk tolerance, whether we're risk seekers, risk neutral or risk averse, tends to be something that's relatively stable, but in different service environments, um, it can move. Okay, but, but generally speaking, as a person, we carry that through our life, our risk tolerance. But what's happened, obviously, is we live in COVID times. 
And COVID times, there's obviously been a lot of sort of talk about this idea of VUCA for the last five or six years, but COVID's probably brought it to a head for most people. So it's called VUCA or VUCA world, and it's this idea that we live in a place and times of volatility. There's a high rate of change. There's a high rate of uncertainty, which is the key word we hear about um, more and more about COVID these days, is that unclear set of what's going to happen now and what's going to happen in the future. There's ambiguity that we're not quite sure and don't have clarity. We don't have full information to make informed decisions. And there's complexity. Things just aren't straightforward. So COVID has brought this sense of VUCA. What this means is that some people will race through the decision process. So it's counterintuitive. What happens is some people shortcut it. So they will see you, they'll make a decision, they'll buy quickly, but they might have regret. They might anticipate, they might bring it back, they might complain because they jump the process quickly because that's how they've responded to VUCA. In other situations, you'll have people who'll hesitate, who'll drag their feet on decisions, who'll do a lot of buck passing. I've just got to ask my wife, just got to ask my kids, just got to ask someone else, just got to ask that person before they make a decision. And these are natural responses to VUCA life, to complexity and to uncertainty. So when your customers are coming through the door in our sort of present times, you need to add this idea that their risk, those that are risk uh, in, sort of averse, are more likely to be feeling anxious and are more likely to hesitate on purchases. Okay, and more likely to actually procrastinate around decision making. So we know that VUCA influences decisions and perceptions of risk. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. We don't know what's happening in a year's time. So as I said, people will go in two directions. The risk seekers, what you'll find is they'll pump through that decision process so fast, they'll just walk in, I want this, thank you, see you later, and they're out the door. But most people will hesitate. Um, now, it's important when we talk about risk to sort of look at it from from this idea that everything we do carries risk. So when they use your service, they're assessing that risk against everything else that's going on in our life. There is nothing that we, we do that doesn't carry some element of risk about it. But we often make informed decisions and we often rely on gut instinct, which is based on that risk tolerance, how much risk we're willing to take. But risk can take lots of forms in services. Remember, a service is intangible. It has no physical form. It's an act, a deed, an experience. It's hard to capture. It's hard to trial. And so what happens is people have lots of different risk. If you look at the decision process for buying a good, something that you can touch and feel and hold, you'll find that it's much quicker than a decision process for buying a service. With a service, the lead up, the pre-decision, is much more deeper and detailed than for a good. And that's because of it being uh, not having a physical form, which is pretty much what this slide says. This idea is that the literature has shown that, look, marketing is, is based on practice, so everything we teach is literally based on what people do. So what we know more and more is that goods are considered low risk by people, simply because you can touch it, feel it, hold it, and as humans, tactile interaction gives us a sense of confidence and assurance, whereas when we're buying something that's a service, it actually elevates our sense of risk because we just don't know what it will do and how it will work. Now, these are, the type, these are the types of risk that are out there. There's seven. I'll talk through them quickly. They don't all exist in all services, but I wanted to show you what they all are. The main one is the top one, functional risk. So when someone walks through your door, a new client who is going to use your service, often what's running through their head in that little speech bubble is, will this service do what it promised? Will they deliver what their market promise was? Okay, And how will I know that they've done that? It's like when you take your car in to be serviced and you're not a mechanic and you don't know. You just pick it up and you think, why? They did it? I don't know. Because you actually don't know. So that's what's called functional risk. That's when we think, oh, you know, is it going to sort of play out? It's a bit like when you go to the movies and you think, geez, I hope this is funny. They said it was going to be. But you're never quite 100% sure until the movie's actually running. A part of that is the nature of the service. Because service is an experience, you can't really evaluate it until you're in the middle of experiencing it and in the moment of it. Another type of risk is physical risk. So obviously, it depends on your service. So it might be personal injury or damage to possessions. Um, so if, say you're taking your dog in to be groomed and you're maybe concerned that there may be some physical risk to them or that, or that they won't be looked after well and they can't talk so they can't tell you. 
Sensory risk is any other impact on the sensors, so depending on your service. This might be, for example, if something's too loud or you know, there's a lot of noise, for example, or people are going to a concert or an event and they can't hear properly uh, because of the audio, for example. So sensory risk might be that you go to a hotel room and you look out and you're looking at it out, open the window and you're looking at a brick wall. So that's a sensory risk because obviously that's not an attractive thing to look at. Social risk is really interesting because we're all social beings and we all like to say that we're all, in, you know, that we all row our own boat and we're not influenced by others, but the fact is we all are. So well, how others think and react about our use of a service or while we're in the service is absolutely critical. This social risk is something that a lot of people don't articulate, but it's often hidden there underneath. Financial risk is obvious. Because it's a service and most people don't know how it's, and, and it's variable, so you can go to the same hairdresser and get your hair cut by that person 10 times and every time it will be slightly different. That's what's called variability because that's the nature of services. Okay, uh, You might go to a doctor 10 times and every time you go it will be a slightly different level of quality of service because it's humans delivering a service to a human and humans are flawed and we don't do things consistently. So with financial risk sometimes there's this idea sitting there that you know, geez, I hope they do it better this time or they hope they do it right. Time loss, big thing these days, we're all time poor, we like to think that we're time poor and so we don't like to waste money. Um, and then personal fears. That psychology is absolutely clear, is, is, is a really key one as well. We don't want to say something silly. We don't want to walk into a new restaurant or a new place or whatever your service is and not know what to say, where to stand, who to talk to, you know, what to do. So that's why the script matters. So in the theatre, so for example, when you came here tonight, there were signs when you got to the top, go here, go left. That's the script, that's the signs that we read as a part of the theatre. So consider as customers first enter your service environment or go onto your web page, is it clear how to navigate it? Do they know where to go? Is it intuitive? Have you built in these sort of safety measures around it? Psychological risk is where we doubt ourselves. It's like when we've got something wrong with our internet and we ring up and say, you know, we sort of, it's sort of doing this, but I'm sort of not sure what it's doing, and you don't have the words, and you don't want to sound silly because you don't know what you're doing, but you sort of do sound silly because you don't know what you're talking about. It's that fear of saying something dumb, basically. I just, that's sort of how it comes out. So how do you alleviate that? How do you remedy these types of risks? So I guess there's seven of them, they don't all apply in all situations, but just be aware that there's different risks that people feel. So what do customers do? This is what customers do, sometimes consciously, sometimes not consciously. They seek information um, from respected personal sources. They'll ask friends, they'll ask family, they'll go online, they'll look at ratings and reviews as well. Okay? They use the internet to compare service offerings. Okay? Those ratings and reviews are, are really key indicators for them. Um, they'll look at the reputation of your organisation as well. They'll look for guarantees or warranties. They'll visit the service facility or go online and, or download your app or whatever you have and they'll ask other employees about your competing service. So they'll go to a competitor and ask them about, about your service to try and get some insight. So we're really quite crafty as human beings is that we find ways around not knowing by asking other people and trusted sources around us. Particularly seeking that extra information from others as well, from trusted others. So what that means is that you can respond in different ways. You can start to, if you can, depending on your service, offering free trials and samples. This helps to alleviate any anxiety and views that people have because they get to try before they buy. Advertising obviously helps to visualise. Visualise the service. If you've got images, for example, if you have a a physical building of your front of house, of what the rooms look like, for example, those types of things, or even pictures of your employees so they know who might be meeting and greeting them when they come along. Those visual keys are really important. Obviously in the 21st century people don't text a lot, they don't like to read a lot because of cognitive load, it makes you, we don't like to use our brains, but we like to look at pictures. <laughs> so <laughs> pictures of things, uh, people like that. Display any credentials or awards that you have, absolutely key. People look at them, they look for them, and they are a sign of trust and they're a sign of external validation. Um, use evidence management. What that means, for example, if you have a place like this, the quality of the chairs, the carpet, the furnishings, the music, the air quality, all those things come into effect to create ambiance, to create a sense of quality and comfort. 
People, because they can't judge your service because it's an act of deed or performance, they'll judge your chair. <laughs> Okay, so they, they will f default to the physical things that they can see. They'll judge the clothes or the uniform of your employee as a sign of the quality of your service because they literally cannot see what you're doing or what the service is itself. Guarantees, encourage visits and give them um, access and information if they order online. You can't talk enough to your customers. You can't keep them informed more as they go along. So risk is seeking increasingly coming into service decisions because we live in these uncertain times. People who are risk averse are more likely to be anxious and procrastinate in the decision making process, even if it's a low involvement service. So when you design your service, design the cut service for the human. Flawed, emotionally driven, okay, then those emotions go up and down with different scripts running through their head as they walk through and use your service. That's a really key part of it. Start with a simple post-it note flowchart. If you want, flesh it out a little bit more. If you want, develop just one or two personas and just say, well, what would they think as they move through? And you've got yourself a bit of a map to start with. And highlight those, those critical points where things may regularly go wrong or do go wrong so you can fix them. But the visual aspect of all of this is really what makes it useful and pulls it all together. So that brings it to an end. I hope that there were some good takeaways in there for you um, and useful and open to questions or Luke's going to open to questions, a whole open. Oh no, I'll handle it, cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jella, um, thanks for you. Um, in terms of the person's persona, what about if it's a company? That you're dealing with, a business? Yeah, yeah you, can, you can actually like almost personify them. Oh, sorry, I'll just repeat the question. With the persona, what if the persona is a business or a company that you're dealing with? You can also do that as well and see of creating a persona for them. You might give them sort of a name and an attitude that they have, and, but that motto is really key because it understands what their motivations are and, and how and why they're engaging with you. So, yeah, another way. Thank you. Um, I work in the market research sector which actually provides a lot of the data that you use for uh, journey maps. Um, and often you find a lot of areas where a company or a service can improve, like you said, touch points. But there's this strange conversation about which ones do we invest in to actually, fit, which ones should we prioritise to fix because you can't fix everything. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how to choose those yeah. ones that are the most important? I think a, a part of, well, it's important, yeah, and so those are those critical incidents and those points are the moments that, mostly obviously those moments of truth at which you know that you will lose the customer or satisfaction will be gained. Typically it's at the point of payment, at the, the end of the process, more so than the beginning. So when people first use a service, they've got what's called a zone of tolerance, which means that they will accept if, because we're humans, if you're flawed or you make a mistake in their order or they have to wait extra. People have this zone of tolerance. And what that means is that at the beginning when they first use your service, they're more forgiving. That's pretty much what it means. As they get along, it sort of gets like this, particularly when it comes to the end of the service. So when you're invoicing or you're moving them out, that is the point at which if you get the bill wrong or something like that, um, that's the point at which you're going to be most upsetting and that's the bit they'll remember. It comes down to the psychology of primacy and recency. They'll remember the first thing you did when you meet and greet them and would you like a glass of water? They remember the last thing you did and the last thing you said. The bit in the middle, no. But that's how I would I would go. But that payment point at the end is a real pressure point. Yeah. And I didn't repeat the question, did I? Sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm aware that the customer journey doesn't stop when they hit that pay button. Yeah. Pay button. From my understanding, it's much more economical to maintain an existing customer than to find a new one. Do you have any tips on, on uh, providing that great service yeah. after they've made that a new customer, say, has made that initial um, transaction? Yeah, and building the relationship with them. Um, so a part of it too is, is really key. So that idea of 
So where it came from was a lot in the, the 80s and 90s, there was just this view of you just kept filling your bucket up. You kept bringing new customers in, new customers in, new customers in. And then there was this sort of view that, okay, our bucket's got a hole in it. We keep losing customers out the bottom. So relationship marketing was this view of let's actually keep the ones we've got because retaining them means that they will buy from us more often. They'll spread more positive word of mouth. We generally get straighter, uh, sorry, more share of wallet from the person as well, um, which means we can make more profit from them over a lifetime. Um, the main thing with building relationships comes down to empathy and understanding of that person. So they often use this idea of that old corner store mentality where you were known, you weren't just a number that came in. And really it comes back to the, a bit like what we saw tonight, human interactions and that's what that human centred design is. So they often talk about empathy and, bond, and another thing is bonding, building that rapport, remembering people's names and engaging with them like their old friends. Um, that really builds it because it's rare today. So when you do that as a service provider, that's when people go, actually, I feel good here. And this is a part of, you know, this is where I want to keep coming back to. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I like how you segmented the, um, the product based and the service based businesses and how long it takes to get a, get a sale to happen in the service based compared to the, the product based businesses. And I guess that's why. Uh, uh, that, that the word of mouth is so important for that, right? So, absolutely. Um, so referrals and that sort of thing is definitely a good thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And what they will do is, sorry, and I'll repeat the question for the because I haven't done it before. Uh, the importance of referrals in the service decision process. Absolutely key. So what happens is, is with goods, what happens is you can assess the quality of the good and what you'll get out of it before you buy it. You can test drive the car, you can try on the sunglasses, you can put the shoes on. With a service you can't do that, even after you purchase it, you're never quite sure whether you bought the right thing. And what you find with it as, as you move from the goods towards the services is that the advice and information reviews of trusted friends becomes more important simply because you can't touch and feel the item. So as we move towards it, so what businesses will trust, uh, sorry, what customers will do is they'd never really trust the information from the service. So you might have a big ad with a testimonial from other people. They'll sit there and go, okay, thanks for sharing that, but I want to talk to real people. And that's why um, word of mouth is absolutely key because they see the word of mouth from a actual customer or from a trusted friend or colleague as being far more credible than what the organisation says about itself. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Of course. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you very much. Look, I hope you got something out of it. <laughs>